Welcome back to episode two of the Commander Brew Crew podcast. It's your boy Millsy back with Hometown Commander, and we are back for another episode of fun. As with me, as always, are my two co-hosts. The uh, the first is very rapidly coming up to being a father, just like I am. It's Josh. Hey, what's up, guys? How do you, how do you feel about becoming a dad, Josh? Uh, I'm pretty stoked. I feel like. Uh, um... There's there's very good and bad points about it, right? Good points being I'm gonna have something that I can spend a lot of time putting uh, like knowledge and, and effort into. Um, but uh, on the bad point, how do I add plus one plus one counters to a baby? It's really hard. Uh, or I- like like <laughs> I don't know if I'd add vigilance because then I feel like she would just indefinitely cry. But you know something like that. Like yeah. if if I could give my baby flying. That'd be really cool. That, Hard that, that'd be kind of scary. <laughs> and I feel like I feel like you, you always just have someone to laugh at your jokes too, which is oh yeah, hundred percent. And the other co-host, as normal, the only man to ever look me at the face and tell me I had a face only a mother could love. It's Andrew. Uh, you forgot to add that uh, the illustrious. Oh, Andrew. that's my bad. Yes, that's my bad. That's my bad. Yes. What's you, up, guys? Well, guys, we are back for our second official episode of Commander Brew Crew. Uh, we all had a ton of fun recording our introductory episode, and I hope you guys will go back and check that out if you haven't. Uh, this week, we're going to start our hopeful two-part discussion of our brewing philosophy, something that I expect will hopefully not sound like a manifesto, but <laughs> but, uh, but just a, a, a little bit of a, uh, a look at, at how we approach deck building and what brewing means to us. But first, I feel like we wouldn't live up to our name if we didn't start all of the podcasts this way. Andrew, what have you been tinkering with this week? Don't me, don't run me down every deck that you've worked on this week, but what's like the one deck you've worked on this week that you've been most excited to to tinker with? Well, so there's been two that I've I think I've been working on, but it's interesting because it's not new. This is like old... Uh, quote quote unquote old uh stuff in in one case um one has been because I'm Boros boy for life uh I finally just decided to bite the bullet and tinker with feather the redeemed uh just because it's like the quintessential Boros commander that I feel like everybody gets around to at some point so I figured you know might as well happen for me and then uh going back uh not quite as far um, doing some tinkering around with the AC Tyrant of Gyre Strait precon and seeing what sorts of things I can add in uh, from some of the more recent sets that have come out. Uh, there's certainly a lot of things uh, like from Kamigawa that I, uh, the Neon Dynasty that I've been adding in there and looking at. Um, but yeah, just seeing what sorts of ways that I can beef that up from just the bare precon. I think AC is within my top, probably my top 10 favorite precons they've done in the last year or two oh, it's yeah. just it's, a good deck and it's the precons actually built pretty well yeah the precons built really well especially given some of the uh play and monetary value of the cards that come inside uh ac uh, itself is just you know a powerhouse uh all on its own but yeah the precon is certainly very well put together josh what what newfangled things do you have to tell us about this week uh i uh been working on several, uh, actually working on three at the same time right now. Uh, but the big one that I, Look at I this feel like I'm really, yeah, <laughs> I just I just build out a deck list and think you know this this is fun, but what's next? You know I'm I'm always on what's next. So uh, first time building an Esper deck. I've uh, oh, got Esper tokens. Esper. Um, gonna be excited for that. I feel like. Uh, um, the uh, Transformers cards were just a little bit overlooked, and I want to build a Token Matters um, Esper. Spicy take of the episode. The Transformers cards were a little overlooked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Such a hard take. Agree. They definitely did not land at all. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, I want to try to build a, a really good Tokens Matters deck uh, and try to see if I can just slam other people's spells down for free. Who doesn't love playing other people's spells? You know, oh, it's I know best. it gets a lot of hate in the community, but like... The feeling you get when you get to play someone else's thing is kind of fun sometimes. Oh, 100%. Locking people out of their own spells by playing them yourself is 
miles better than just plainly walking other people out of their own and, and like the best and worst feeling at the same time is when you attack with something like a tolly right or like oh. you get something off someone's deck and that person realizes what you got off their deck and they're like no <laughs> as they realize their take, strategy's just falling apart take their primary win con from them <laughs> well but see then i i always just have a little bit of guilt just oh, doing stuff sure. like that i just like i'm like listen i'm sorry I did this to you. <laughs> I also, I feel like a lot of the times, like, my reaction to it is dependent on how long it took to set up. Like, if you had to get a bunch of pieces on board and then do it, like, like for a tally, you had to lay that, you had to get that thing on board and then wait the turn to attack me or anyone else with the table. The table had its time to get rid of a tally when it was oh, needed. Yeah, 100%. But like, but like, if you were to just play some spell that's like, oh, you know, exile the top 10 cards of everyone's deck and play two cards of it for free, or which would be an, abnorm- an enormously broken oh, yeah. spell. But if it was, like, out of nowhere, I think I'd be a little bit more annoyed than if, like, we literally all saw it coming and then, yeah. and then it happened. You know? That's what this uh, this Esper Tokens deck is going to take a little bit more time to set up and get right because um, you only get to cast spells with the exact same mana value of uh, damage, combat damage that you dealt with tokens. So if I deal a little bit more, one more, right? Mana value for what? What is Blasphemous Act? Thirteen or something like that? Uh, yeah, I think it's either thirteen yeah. or fourteen. But something yeah. like that. So if I if I deal seventeen damage with tokens, can't do it. And the other part much. to remember about uh, that is when spells are reduced, they still count as their original mana value on the stack. Oh, so yeah. it's, it's not like you know if you had something that reduced the amount of you know cost it took you to cast spells or sorceries or instants or whatever it it still wouldn't factor in yeah. you'd still have to get it right on the dot yeah so that's why i think this one this uh this tokens matters deck will be very interesting because it's me trying to cast stuff for free but i have to be very precise with the way that i'm dealing this damage and and then just to just to be clear this is soundwave sonic spy that you're building around yep yep soundwave um i he, love that uh, you could have just said soundwave but you made sure to really get in the- <laughs> oh you've got to get the sonic spy in there if you've watched it's- the series you know it's very important that soundwave is a spy yeah, Millsy, come on. But he doesn't turn into a gun. I feel like that's no, the, like, he doesn't. <laughs> he turns he turns into a boombox, and that's definitely not what you associate with spy. <laughs> what are you talking about? That how else are you gonna play this super cool spy James Bond music? I get, dude. That's right. I, I forgot that in Mission Impossible and 007 and all those movies, they always have a boombox on their shoulders while they're trying to be sneaky. It's, exactly. like, it's like attached to a carabiner on their on their waist as they're like <laughs> as they're like lowering themselves into a bank to heist yeah. it. You just yeah. have this giant boombox. Yeah. Just <laughs> one of those cool guys in the 80s and 90s carrying the boombox oh, on their shoulder. Tell them, hold up, guys! I forgot to rewind my eight track from the last time I did this. Let me rewind it really quick before we drop into this bank we're, vault. We've gone past we've gone past Walkmans with tapes. No, we're all the way back to eight tracks. Yeah. Hundred percent. Well, Joshua, what else? Uh, what's another one that you've been looking at? Uh, Teamer spell spammer is what I'm calling this one. Um, spell spammer. Yeah, I'm back in. Not forth. spell jammer. Oh no, <laughs> TM. Not like, at all. Like, 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 like the spell spam. I'm uh, I'm back and forth between um, Riku and Calamax. Um, <sighs> what a fun space. Calamax. To be in. Calamax. I want to do because he does Calamax things. Um, but also, uh, you. Just pay two, right? Um, I think it's a red and a blue for uh, copying instant and sorcery. Yeah, Riku, Riku goes pretty hard. And, yeah, yeah, and then it's a blue and a green for um, right. copying creatures. Oh, I thought it was just permanence in general. Uh, it might be sense. permanence. I don't know, but I'm, I'm not going to have either. Either way, there's there's a spells and then there's the. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I'm uh, I'm back and forth between the two of those because my whole idea with that deck, I'm building it off of a very specific combo piece. Love it. Already in. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, hardcore gray. Already in. Doesn't it, even matter what the pieces I'm in. <laughs> and Displacer Kitten. Mmm, sexy. Oh, no. So, uh, new Atali. New Atali. New Atali. When, it does it when it comes yes, in. Yes, not, not we need, to, we need to clarify that because Old Atali, that does absolutely nothing. There's no point in blinking Old Atali. Um, new Atali just. There is a good reason to strap indestructibility tokens. to Atali and take infinite combats. But oh, there, one hundred percent. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But oh, when um, I when I saw New Atali, I looked at it, and then in the back of my head, I was like, "We didn't need more cards for Displacer Kitten to combo with. We already had Dockside and plenty of other things." But 100%. sure, yeah, let's put a giant dinosaur in with it. What's the oh, worst that yeah. can happen? Oh yeah, that can potentially just one shot uh, with toxic damage. Just 
My first right response when we saw Tali was it doesn't it doesn't go and cast sad face. <laughs> like, oh, oh yeah. man, yeah, what, that's what a true. world it would be. That's true. What sad day, but uh, also a Tali's gonna do it's a Tali thing, which I'm excited for. Well, I can't wait to get wrecked by that. Oh yeah. It's it that's another one that'll probably take a little bit because um Teamer doesn't have uh be very careful about you in this sentence. Okay. <laughs> Teamer does not have boatloads of um uh, I, I was going to say fetch cards, but that's for lands. Um, tutors, like Black does. Um, but there is enough for me to get those two specific creatures out. Uh, I think you've got plenty. Oh, yeah. No, th- th- there is. It's just I, yeah. I enjoy playing. Creatures, in, yes, you're in green. Yes, perfect. Yes. Spells, perfect. You're in blue. Mm-hmm. Um, and you also have Gamble, if you want to just flip that Yeah, coin. that's true. <laughs> that's true. Everybody's and, and I favorite did, card. I did get a really nice foil gamble proxy from uh, my buddy Millsy here so I can definitely throw that thing in there I love gamble gamble's such a fun card and I love I love the moment when someone gambles and then you see them discard and they're like was that what you got they're like yeah <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Like, <laughs> you know it's not like decks that use like in tomb right where your whole goal is to put that thing in your graveyard oh, yeah um, well I mean other than the things that I'm brewing for the channel which is never ending uh, the of course the the deck I have been tinkering around with the most this week and I feel like it's pretty obvious a- after you guys speaking with me this week uh, i am looking at converting my gorklaw list over to Sorak and gorklaw and i've had a uh, ton of fun what a shocker i what know a right twist yeah you know you know what i think is really crazy is why not add haste on a on a commander that already does really cool things but anyway Wait, because um, that's what so green needs you mean yeah. that you're getting free haste when when uh your win con and all of the other decks was to get haste yes so you get free win con Yes. I wow. Mean, my, my thought was, uh, you know, I had someone ask me, are you okay with losing the the natural reduction that you get from Gorklaw being in the command zone? And I said, well, there's plenty of other things in this color to reduce spells. But I think the, the you got to remember the key point of any creature deck ending the game is getting into combat and ending the game. And I would much rather have to pay a little bit extra and get that baked in haste rather than try to find a concordant crossroads or something like that to finish that right that end game out so um, that makes sense sure there's still finale devastation there's still plenty of other things you can use to give haste and end the game but why not give just a little bit of baked in fun uh, the other thing i'm excited about that deck list is because it puts plus one plus one counters on things um i get to use things like kadam of the west tree to give all of my modified creatures trample and they all go get basic lands and they deal combat damage to players it's just gonna help you ramp right i just think there's so many other things uh, we get to use that and, of course, we get uh, a bunch of new green creatures for me to try because I get to care about some different things. Instead of them just being power, f- you know, power four or greater, I yeah. get to reduce some, you know, some different and play some different creature spells. So I'm pretty darn excited about that. The other deck that's going to be coming out here within the next week or so that I'm working on myself for myself is Hensi Toolbox Tori. We're going to be doing the kind of Blitz Jun deck. I'm having a lot of fun trying to find a sweet spot for what I want because I feel like it's just turned into, like, uh, uh, there's 80 creatures that I think are good for this deck. How do I how do I make that into 30? So that's been a ton of fun. No, you keep it at 80 and just run 20 lands. Oops, all lands. <laughs> I mean, I definitely, I definitely have only 23 lands in my uh, Grixis Color. Demons deck, and demons are not cheap. So I think you could make it work. I believe in you. Uh, I'm pretty excited. I, the thing I love about decks like like Hensy is when you build a deck that you don't normally build, and you get to have some fun learning about new cards and friends that we're that's what we're going to talk about today we're going to talk about our brewing philosophy in a lot of ways so first off i just want to start by getting a kind of bird's eye view of what is brewing to you and what does it mean to you i'll start Uh, to me brewing isn't just making a deck brewing is crafting a deck and a strategy and an idea whether it's from inspiration or from nothing you are kind of building a deck to your taste uh, to to accomplish what you want from it. It's not just slapping 100 cards into a list and shipping it. It's it's finding inspiration or what you want from a deck in that deck. And, and to me, brewing is also um, changing and adapting a deck over time as well. It's not just that first, you know, 99 card list that you put together for a commander deck. It's also the way a deck changes over time. Uh, but... Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's more or less how I would probably sum up brewing for me. What do you guys think? So when you say, you know, you, you have that idea, um, for you, is that more of a, a... Do you find yourself more often in the early stages of brewing having that idea mechanically from the game or thematically? Or maybe 
little column A, little column B. I think more often than not, for me, it's strategy. Because I, you know, we have a double-edged sword in Commander, right? We have access to so many cards, so many cards. But the problem is we have to kind of reel them in, right? We have to make this cohesive list that exists. More often than not, I find it being, here's my idea for what I want the deck to do, and then finding pieces to fit that deck, as opposed to... there. But there have been times where I... Uh, Perfect example, Arcane Bombardment is an enchantment that I looked at and go, I'm going to break this in a deck. And, and, I, and I feel like I've built a deck to do that. So it isn't it's always possible. <laughs> it isn't always one specific card. It is from time to time. But more often than not, I would say it's either a commander or a strategy. Gotcha. Yeah, I've found that as I go about my magic life and my magic brewing, uh, a lot of what you said rings true for me, too. There's a, there's an idea or a notion or something that I just, I feel an itch to very quickly try to piece something together. Uh, but for me, I often try to do, I think, it more thematically um, in a sense of, uh, for example, uh, a deck that I've tragically not used as much as I want to. Um, I, uh, a while ago, brewed and built and assembled a uh, Queen Marchesa uh, deck because who doesn't love some politics and making people mad, uh, wheeling and dealing with the with the devil. Um, and that was probably one of the most fun times I've ever had brewing things together because it was just so fun to scroll through uh, card databases and try to find uh, cards that had to do with uh, being a queen or a monarch. Not, not the monarch mechanic, uh, but having to do with, you know, courtly intrigue and ruling uh, with an iron fist or with bribes or putting cards like black market connection or the voting, the, the will of the council effect where you do voting, um, you know, things like that, uh, that I that was that was a lot of fun to just see, you know, maybe this isn't the greatest card to go in this. It's not super synergistic, but uh finding a way to thematically make things come together in a way that almost tells like a story is what I really enjoy doing. And that, that is like true brewing to me. I feel like, uh, like brewing is kind of a good expression of yourself. Um, and, uh, feeling like I'm broken is uh, a really good inspiration for me trying to find the most broken cards that I can to put into a deck. Mm. Uh, I Preach just it. love Preach. doing that, you know? Amen. Um, <laughs> but uh, really, I, I being able to like set up these awesome combos and stuff like we were just talking about with uh, New Atali and Displacer Kitten is like one of the big things that I've recently started brewing with. Uh, when I first started, it was, I don't have any cards so what decks can I build for under $100? Which um, you'll see with my uh, Yuriko uh, Ninjas deck, which, uh, I mean, Yuriko does Yuriko things. So like even Yuriko with... costs more than the deck. Like oh, it's, yeah, it's no, like yeah, Yuriko. The rest of the deck literally costs less than Yuriko. Yeah, yeah 100%. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think the, the next closest thing to Yuriko is probably like Blink of an Eye or something like that. I don't remember. But um, it's, a, it's 100% a budget deck. Um, I didn't even know I had Yuriko. Uh, until Michael said something about her being a really good card. And I was like, oh, I think I've seen that before and looked through a shoebox that I'd gotten from my boss and she was sitting at the bottom. And I was like, oh, so you're telling me this is like top five commanders of all time? Okay, I'll build a deck around it. But, um... Uh, Certainly top five popular. I would, yeah, I would yes, say yes. Power level is there too. The term too, top but... five commanders of all time could be an episode in its own right. Yeah, probably, <laughs> but... probably. Um, I, I still I still think that uh, Golos needs to come back. I, I love Golos. Oh. Um, I well, know that he we probably don't have time won't. Please, uh, please, <laughs> please, wizards, no. It's, <laughs> it's fine where it is. Um, I have a Golos deck that I've built in the chance that wizards ever decides it would be fun to like let people okay, break I'm gonna, that I'm going to ask the honest question. But, you haven't found any other five color commanders that can't pilot that deck just as efficiently as Golos can? No, I have. I just want Golos. Oh, okay. I just, I just <laughs> needed to make sure. Exclusively <laughs> because he's banned. Yes, 100%. Be, not just because he's banned, but yes, because he's banned. Um, but I, um, back to the uh, back to the whole philosophy, um, I feel like you being able to express um, like kind of 
inner workings of the way that you think about, you know, just even day to day problems is is really cool um, in the way that you brew. And while you may not necessarily notice them, uh, other people that you're playing with may be able to. So I think that that's that's really interesting because people's personalities really come out when you start looking at not just the commanders that they're playing, but also the uh, like you, you've you've talked before, Millie, Millsy, about um, many commanders that you have within your deck to kind of help push your your strategy. And looking at those many commanders that people will keep within their deck is also another really good way to kind of see like, oh, this is the way this person thinks and the ideas that they have and stuff. And uh, uh, it also shows your shows you the, that person's kind of uh, um, creativeness. That's a really good perspective. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I've ever thought about it that way before. Oh yeah, yeah we'll, we'll um, uh, I definitely want to talk about the idea of secondary and alternate commanders. We'll get to that in a little bit because I want to I want to pack that open a little more. But I want to kind of let's keep the conversation a little bit air air level right now, and then we'll start nose diving into yeah, the yeah, specifics. Yeah, yeah. Um, so where do you guys find yourself starting more often? Specific commanders or specific strategies? I'd say for me, honestly, more often than not, it's specific strategies, and I'm trying to find the best commander that that gets all of the boxes I want for that strategy. So so let me give you a perfect example. The, the deck archetype that I'm still absolutely smashing my head up against the wall with is is uh, Super Friends. It's a, it's a deck type that I've been wanting to try to find something to build. And I've gone back and forth between like four commanders, and I still haven't found one that like hits everything I want from the deck, but all four of them have gotten close in their own way. You guys have seen me play the the Kethis um, Arista Friends deck, is what I call it, because it's Aristocrats and Super Friends. And that's probably the closest deck I've gotten to come to what I want it to be. But I just... I don't know. Is it too much to ask for the exact perfect thing that I want every time? Why why can't I just have what I want every time? I mean, <laughs> like, just just play the prismatic bridge like everybody else does. But I, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I can't. I, 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 that card gives me nightmares. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. But My- what do you guys think, Josh? What do you think? Specific commanders more than often, or or maybe a desired strategy or certain cards more often. Uh, it's kind of back and forth. I mean, I built a uh, um, I built an entire Marisi deck. Off of the companion, not even the commander. Um, Yo, shout out companions in general. Oh yeah, hundred percent. They're right. awesome. I, I wish that You're there the were more, ones. but also I understand why there's not more. Yeah, you shout know? out to the companion that got banned literally immediately because oh, it could yeah. get paid in every blue, blue, yeah, blue, I know. blue, uh, blue red deck. Yeah, <laughs> I love it, man. But um, it's a, uh, um, I feel like uh there's been a lot of times that I have built around very specific commanders, but there are also times that I'm like, Oh, I want to build uh even not just like the strategy specifically, but an idea. Um, I built plenty and you've seen a bunch of them, uh, plenty of tribal decks. Like uh, yeah, I would include tribes in my strategies because they yeah. really are right. Yeah. If you want a tribal decks are a strategy, right? You're, you're building a, a deck around one creature type and all of the interactions yeah. between them. Yeah. So like sure. uh, um, my uh, mono white Avacyn deck. Um, love that. Uh, I'm there is there is a, a broader strategy than uh, just a bunch of angels in it uh, because I do have a few that aren't angels like clerics and stuff like that. that honest, help push most it, but... most tribal strategies have sub synergies that yeah. aren't tribal. Like if, I mean, every tribe has some real sub strategy in it, whether it's plus yeah. some encounters or angels have life gain, right? Or mm-hmm. right, all of them have them, and it's it's about recognizing and understanding that for sure. Like Avacyn's is just a world slayer nuking oh, everybody, um, which. Millsy absolutely loves the, the fact that you've pulled that off what more than once right oh there was one night I think I got it twice I think you've, in a night I think you pulled it off every time you played that deck against yeah. me which is ridiculous yeah. well I mean <laughs> there's there's all of those uh, um, uh, artifact tutors in white that help with Steel that. shapers gift so, yeah. Uh, yeah, open the armory yeah 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 for sure but um so like I've done that but then uh, recently I decided I wanted to build a uh, treasure deck so I was kind of looking around at like what um what commander would be good for treasures? Uh, and I landed on uh, Rakdos in Jury, uh, Master of Review. Um, so I, I started building that out. I think I'm at like 68 cards or something like that. Jury's a really fun commander that a lot of people really love. Andrew, how about you? Specific commanders more often or, or more strategies? I know you love the themes. I, I obviously might be part of your answer, so I'm sure the themes could factor either way. But but minus that, in the in the instances where it's not a theme, do you find it more often to be a, a specific commander or or that theme or more like that strategies more often? Yeah, I think I can count on one hand 
the number of times I brew because I've, I've you know brewed dozens and dozens and dozens of of decks. Um, I think I can count on one hand the number of times I've brewed around a strategy or a mechanic of some kind. Almost always it's been, oh hey here's this commander. Uh, I want to see what I can do with this because this prompts or sparks this idea. Um, so like the first deck that I made outside of a precon, so just completely from scratch, was Sir Gwyn, Hero of Ashvale. Um, and it was exclusively just because uh, I already had some exposure to the red and white colors uh, through the Wyleth precon, which was the first deck I had ever played uh, for, for Magic. Um, so I had a little bit of exposure there, and it was continuing the theme of equipment. But more so than that, I'm just like, look at this dope art look how oh, cool yeah. this commander looks and it's uh it's knight it's powerful it's got some card draw like you know I, but predominantly just like cool knight is cool uh <laughs> but an example of the opposite um th- this might be a hot take maybe not um i thought the blood tokens that came out in crimson vow was a cool mechanic and I keep finding myself coming back to it. And I've now probably got three different lists for three different formats on using blood tokens. So that's a rare example of, you know, sort of a mechanic that popped up that I'm like, I can I, I can work with this. This this seems fun because, again, the, the mechanic itself is very thematic in cases like that. I have a gut feeling there's probably someone listening to the podcast who's going well, how how do you start with a strategy but not necessarily have a commander in oh, mind, yeah. right? Because for some strategies, like tribal, for example, there's a there's a pretty easy answer most of the time, right? Yeah. Where you're starting, right? Certain tribes tend to live in certain colors, and so, right, the more narrow it down. But um, let me give you an example like plus one, plus one encounters. Um, there's a lot of different colors that deal with plus one, plus one counters and deal with them in different ways. And what commander you choose for that strategy, right? Is going to depend on how you build your deck, what your win con is, right? Things like that. So it's it's not always nitty gritty on oh, as soon as I pick this strategy, I automatically have this commander. Whereas I feel like if you start with the commander first, more often you lock yourself into a certain type of strategy because um, you know Corvold will always do Corvold things. You oh, know, yeah. certain commanders will will do what they're good at, whether you try not to build around them or not. You know, you can the- try to make just an awful. Corvold deck that it attempts to fail and it will not. <laughs> so where where more often than not, where do we start? Uh, you know, for me, sometimes it's a pen and a pad and a list of random cards that I think would work well together. Sometimes it's a app on my phone or mock sealed and I throw a bunch of cards into a list together to start. Uh, where do you guys find yourself more often starting? Uh, I really like the search and filter uh, functions that are found in the app mana box. Um, that's huge that I, I use very little there. There are times where I'll be on like a desktop and I'll use, uh, architect, um, because that has a lot of, I, I know that the, the filtering and search tools are, are fairly similar across all, uh, deck building apps and websites and things like that. Um, but more so, you know, just at something like that, where it's, it's easy to, you know, hit, find this keyword or search for a car that has this in its text. Uh, for for me, uh, yeah, that's that's um, that's using uh, apps like Mana Box or or uh, Scra- um, so, no, Scra- um, Architect. Uh, typically, mine is uh, whether I'm picking a strategy or a uh, um, a commander. They they vary a bit differently. If I'm picking a specific commander, um, I will create a deck within the uh, the collection and deck building app that I've got on my phone called Top Deck. Uh, and it'll give me ideas and suggestions based off of what a lot of other people have within their deck. Um, it's not going to get super nitty gritty involved like you would find on uh, something like EDH Rec or something like that, where you can say, I want this commander um, based off of these, like like a plus one, plus one theme or yeah. something like that. You know, It's just um, saying, hey, the people in our app that use this commander play cards like this. Yeah, yeah. and sometimes I'll look through that, but the... Uh, um, it, it differs when I'm picking a specific strategy, like uh, when I was picking treasures. Um, I was I started thinking, okay, what do I want that can create a bunch of these? So I started thinking of like some of those like 
super um uh I I don't want to say overpowered, but like commonly used cards when you think of token or uh um treasure creators like uh, like Dockside or something, right? Um or uh um the dragon is it is it copper ancient copper dragon that creates you got gold span yeah who not only makes you treasures but doubles the amount of measure, treasure you get from yep. them yep. yeah so yeah. stuff like or that right just start treasure. yeah just start dumping a bunch of those i found a lot of them surprisingly were in red i uh, maybe not surprisingly to me i was like oh wow i figured that there would be more in uh, like a different color yeah no but, it's it's been primarily in red yeah so um, but go through and create a bunch of those and um or pick a bunch of those and then find the commander afterwards that i feel like would benefit the most from having those but it's uh it's typically um get this list together start adding it to a uh to that to that um app um and then uh just kind of see, like, I'll go online on, like, Reddit, or I'll go on EDH rec or whatever it may be, and just search treasure, right? Or if it's a commander's name, I'll search that commander's name in, in uh, EDH rec or Moxfield or something like that and look at other lists uh, and try to find something that's based off of that similar similar kind of thing. So I take a lot of inspiration from other people who have built decks. Uh, it is kind of difficult to filter out the people that have decks that are built that probably don't perform well because I, I can tell you there's been plenty of times that I have built decks that brick, like brick, brick. Um, and uh, those lists are listed on uh, um, yeah. on all the sites that I use. And so I, I, I don't know if I'm looking at someone who has a, a brick list that I'm building off I of. I think you but, can tell pretty quickly sometimes when you look at a list whether or not it's been iterated on or not. You know, you can, oh, yeah. you can look for those consistency type cards that, like, I'll give you a perfect example. I brew, I brew two to three decks a week for the channel, right? And a yeah. lot of these decks are decks I've, I'm never going to pilot, but I'm still trying to build them as I would if I were to pilot them. But they're probably going to be lacking some of the consistency, some of the card draw that maybe you'd get out of a deck once you play it and you start yeah. to realize where the shortfalls are. Well, and, and I think there's a lot of times where you see a deck list or you see a card even uh, where you're, you're it looks really good on paper, but then in actuality when you start to play it, it's like, oh, wait, no, th- this is not nearly as good as I thought it would be. Um, so, yeah, it's also hard to kind of gauge some of that just by looking at it on a screen uh, or, or otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. So I do most of my actual brewing uh, on Moxfield. I, I, do, okay. I do keep some notes and stuff like that or on my phone or on paper, but most of my actual deck building is on Moxfield. It sounds like to both of me that you guys use apps on your phone primarily more than an app on the computer, so to speak, like Moxfield or Architect, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, top deck is is on my phone. It's also I have a desktop app for it that um, functions. Uh, it looks pretty similar, but it works okay. a lot better on the desktop. If I'm at my computer, I'll do that. But typically, whenever I'm at my computer, it's because I'm already doing something different. Um, I couldn't tell you how many times I'm sitting out in the world, wherever during the day, not at my computer, and I think, wow, that would be a great card to go in X Y Z deck, and I'll I'll I'll. You know, that's one thing I'm honestly on trying to do a little bit better at is making some sort of system where I could. So like, so to pick back the curtain a little bit, I'm already realizing through Frexia LB1 and March of the Machine that like a couple of my main decks are probably going to get changed up a little bit. Oh, you know, yeah. We talked about me rebrewing Gorkla at the start of the episode. And there's a couple of my other decks that I can tell are going to get some cards added. So I'm right now I'm kind of trying to formulate a system on my phone where I can maybe add some cards to consider for the next time I sit down and take a look at each of the decks and try to talk through, you know, the kind of cards I want to add. Um, obviously, we've all mentioned different database sites like Scryfall or Gatherer. Um, if anyone out there uses Gatherer over Scryfall, uh, I would recommend Scryfall. I just yeah, think it's I'm, a better database I'm sorry database that you overall. use that over, over Scryfall. Uh, Scryfall is such an interesting. I haven't really played around with all the, like, the different uh, search types and stuff like that you can use. But um, I've been trying to get better at it. It's just pretty tough. We've mentioned EDHREC. EDHREC obviously is one of the best deck resources out there in Commander. Not just because it has things broken down by the Commander, but I think it's a good way to, like you said, Andrew, maybe potentially find cards that you didn't know existed. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there, there was one time where I have um, I was looking to take the... Uh, Boros Ravnica standard, you know, pre-constructed deck, um, and turn that into um, uh, t- turn that into a commander deck with uh, Aureli- uh No, I'm sorry, with Eroes uh, leading that as the commander. 
Um, and yeah, uh, Scryfall, and you know, really finally understanding how to use the the filter functions and syntaxing to find some cards that I had never heard of before. I had never thought to think of before, uh, really opened up a lot of brewing opportunities and options for me. The thing I like about EDH Trek is, you know, people, people start with EDH Trek, like people just go in there, you take the average deck, you copy it and call it your own. But EDH Trek itself even has a lot of things. Once you start messing around with it, you know, you can, you can filter a commander by a strategy, right? Um, the other part that's pretty cool is, uh, every commander in EDH Trek has a link to any of those popular deck building platforms like Moxfield or Taft Out or, uh, architect where you'll actually be able to go and then see a lit you know see a list of other people's lists that you can go look through as well so um i do find that pretty interesting the, the, the other thing that i do i don't know if you guys have thought about doing something like this but right every every new set we have spoiler season right cards are coming out and they don't just come out on places like twitter you know also people are posting about it on reddit you know reddit's such a great resource for that the one thing that i will do is if a new commander comes out for a set and i'm interested in building that later I will save the Reddit post where someone spoils it for the first time on both the Magic TCG subreddit and the EDH subreddit because most of the time what will happen is people will get into conversations about cards they think they should play or strategies they're finding out or combos they're figuring out. And then when I come back to it, I can read through those comments and go, yeah, I never would have thought about that. Because, right, everyone's just like us. They have individual cards that they like or don't like or ideas that they have just like us when we're scratching them down on our on our deck building apps i'm sorry you mean to say that reddit is a place to get information yeah it's a place that has information for you to learn and (laughs) i know we're giving a lot of credit to reddit there but (laughs) okay is there anything else you guys think we missed as far as bring philosophy goes without getting too too much in the nitty-gritty of building a deck are there any things that you, else that you kind of find that you want to mention before we wrap up this section in maybe your approach to starting uh, a deck? Tokens are cool, but big creatures go burr. Okay. You, you heard it here first, El- folks. Eldrazi <laughs> for the win all the time. If every deck was just an Eldrazi deck, Josh would be Josh would be happy, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, of the two... Uh, um, creature types that are very little is known about um me specifically thinking of uh, eldrazi and slivers um i feel like uh eldrazi are a lot more fun colorless go burr man oh yeah it's pretty insane how well colorless can not only produce mana but do it quickly all right guys so let's get let's let's transition a little bit towards a little more of the nitty-gritty so we're so we're moving from our plane's eye view to starting our spiral downwards into more specific um, ideas and things like that. Um, what what are your favorite color or color combinations to so brew? This I, is not necessarily meaning your favorite color combinations to play if they're different. But what do you find yourself? You know, what color color combinations do you find yourself enjoying to brew more? So I, I want to take this a step further. I want to see if I can guess. Oh, <laughs> oh okay, Hundy P, baby, let's do it. So, Milzy, uh, we know that you have a passionate. And eternal love of all things green. To to my detriment. Yeah. <laughs> to, to a severe detriment. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, you, you have a wide variety of decks that I've seen you bring to the table, that I see that you brew. You know, on, on the channel as well, you know, you do a wide variety. But I would say that the color combination that you are all probably more inclined to have some fun with and go crazy about... Or at least have a lot of uh, fi- card favorites is uh, red, wa- uh, not red, uh, red green. Like oh, gruel. gruel for sure. Um, I would say my favorite color combination to brew is probably teamer. Adding the blue into Ooh, it. Yeah. There's been more more teamer decks that I wish I could build that I haven't just because I've kind of stopped myself. But no, gruel is my favorite two color combination. It encompasses everything that I want in Magic. Uh, so yeah, you're 100 percent right. Get big and get fast, uh, Josh. You know we've already discussed your love of all things colorless oh, yeah. and, and giant um but i know that you've had a lot of fun with doing all things the grixis so oh, blue yeah. black red uh you've you've had the fun demons list uh you got the um and i know that is an, is an extent and a, a kind of a rebranding of the warhammer precon yep um so that's going to be my guess for you outside of colorless. Now, Andrew, the guess for you is really hard because I think you've built, a, you've brought a lot of decks to the table. You know, you, you, you really try to switch it up, but 
I, I think the the de- the color combination I find you coming back to more often than not is a you just you just really love a certain wedge color combination. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep <laughs> dragging this out. But they, <laughs> no, you you love your Mardu De- Mardu Dex man, and I and I love how much fun you have with that color it's, combination because um, it's such a cool color combination. It it is a problem because I know there's like I I understand that there is a good solid argument in case to be made for the green and blue color pairing as being you know the powerhouse color pairing in the current state of magic um i just there's something about red black and or red that just everything about those cards the art the themes of each of those colors individually and the way that they come together that is just very very appealing to me and yeah more often than not the art for a lot of those colors uh, and those color combinations are also just super enticing and get my creative brewing mind going as well. Also, you were in the color combination of some of the best removal of all time, the best board wipes Amen. of all time. Oh, board wipe tribal or nothing. <laughs> uh, is uh, is Armageddon just uh, an auto include in your deck? Not Armageddon. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I kind of argue there's strictly better board wipes than Armageddon. Oh, <laughs> yeah, days. no, Armageddon is just to be mean. Uh-oh. Yeah, Arm- Armageddon is the mean board wipe. Um, Farewell is the one that, <sighs> that uh, wins you games. Okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, I yeah. have so much love and hatred for Farewell. All right, well, Josh, do you, do you think his guess on your favorite color combination is fair? Or, or would you say you find yourself defaulting a little bit differently um i'd say yeah actually um that's 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 pretty fair i do like uh i do like mike rixis a lot i didn't think i would i honestly when i first started playing um i thought that white was like my color i thought that was like my thing right and i think for two color combinations um i enjoy building and brewing celestia decks a lot more um but i don't ever play with them because they just don't match the kind of like super aggressive play style that I have, like Grixis decks do. Can I interest you in tokens? <laughs> oh yeah, it? yeah. That's so a token knocks on your door. Tokens are cool and all, and uh, as cool as pawns are, I really like playing with uh, with with those big chunky demons. I mean, if stuff. we found anything, it's that if you play comp, if you play token decks right, they do pretty well. Um, oh yes, I-, I would see Andrew. You are spot on because. A lot of the three color decks I like to play are either in Teamer or Naya, right? Teamer adding blue, Naya adding white. And I think both of those three color combinations take your green red um, base and add different things. Blue adds some card draw and some other things to it. White adds a lot of more of the go wide strategies. And of course, I've found probably my two favorite commanders in each of those um, color combinations over the last like year or so. And they've been a ton of fun to play. Oh, yeah. So, um, more often than not, when you guys are brewing, do you find yourself kind of choosing a strategy when you start and kind of keep it in mind as you're finding cards or searching cards? Or have there been times where you've kind of said, this is my commander, and then as you look through your possible options, you you find some sort of strategy you didn't expect? Like, I'll say for me, more often than not, I probably have a good shot at what I want the strategy of a deck to be when I walk into the deck. But I mean, there has been times where you start realizing what card pool you have in front of you. And as you find cards, you go, wait, like why has no one built this commander this way? (laughs) And then you kind of find yourself, you know, moving and changing that way. Yeah. I don't know that there's very many times where I've felt like, um, I felt the need to change my strategy or, or found something that, that makes me want to change the original concept that I have. Um, and that's probably something uh, a lacking skill. That's something that I probably need to work on developing, and you know, give myself challenges more so of just like, all right, break the mold on this. Like you know, take a take a popular commander. Um, we, we brought up Yuriko. Uh, I know that even Sir Gwyn is even like a, a decently popular commander, mm-hmm. um, especially as far as the Mardu colors are concerned. Um, you know, finding one like that and giving myself a challenge of like, okay, what is a different way that I can do this uh, and have that be some sort of like practice for me? Because I, I find that I, I'm i usually pretty stubborn and I will, uh, to, to use a phrase you used earlier, Millsy, uh, I, I will smash my head against a wall trying to get something to work even when uh, in all reality it probably doesn't. That is my room <laughs> style to a T. I may smash my head against the wall until I make it work uh, kind of brewer. And there's definitely been a, 
a couple decks that I've brewed in the past were like, I tried so long with other commanders, and then a new commander came out that literally just like, you know, that light from heaven shone down, and I finally figured out where the deck needed to be, and that was my catalyst to make it, but... That's me trying to find an Abzan commander that I liked, and then they just <laughs> made Thalia on the Gitrog monster. <laughs> they heard your cries. Oh, yeah, dude. I'm, I'm so glad Wizards I also that. feel like when it comes to, like, like, a strategy like that with Abzan, it's also, like, a broken clock is at least, is, is twi- right, at least twice a day, right? Yeah. Like, eventually one's going to come around that's going to catch your eye, even if you wait long enough, especially yeah. at the rate that Wizards is making new commanders these days. Josh, what do you think? Do you- I think uh, there's there's one very specific deck that I can think of that I built around one strategy, and it did something completely different, but it actually did it well. It wasn't even... And on the first iteration of the deck, I didn't really have to modify it very much to continue that strategy afterwards. Um, but I was tired of getting punched in the face by 57,000 green-white tokens, human tokens, in Millsy's Kyler deck. It was oh. driving me up the wall. I couldn't yeah, do a, it. That was, that was a fun deck, yeah. Um, every time I played against that, it felt like I was just walking on Legos barefooted or, like, kicking my pinky toe into the door the door trim. I couldn't do it. Such um, wonderful descriptive so language. <laughs> built, I built a deck specifically around shutting down humans because all of the tokens that you created were humans. Yep. <laughs> so um, I built Micaeus. And... It was only supposed to be... Which Micaeus? The black one. Okay. Yeah, black, yeah. black uh, uh, creatures have undying, non-humans you control have plus one, plus one, or something like that. Um, uh, I built it entirely around zombies, uh, just because Micaeus is a zombie. You might as well make the other creatures and their zombies. Um, and I accidentally built a massive zombie tokens deck. Yeah, it's a pretty um, solid I deck. was trying to kill your tokens and didn't mean to make tokens of my own. But uh, my, then you did zombie. Things, my first, you... yeah, my first playthrough. I think I ended up with twenty three eight eight zombies on the board, and you guys were like, "Oh, okay, uh, that's a thing." And I was like, "Yeah, I didn't know it was a thing, but apparently it is." And so now Micaeus is my not only anti Kyler deck, um, which it's kind of funny that that it would be trying to kill Kyler, in my opinion, but um, it's it's my my big dumb black deck which you don't really hear it such together it does <laughs> such a good job uh the next two little uh little sub points i want to talk about here are things that i find myself doing a lot and i, I mainly want to see where you guys track with this i hope that when you watch me brew my decks or you play against my decks you notice a lot of this in the decks that i brew because it's something that i actively keep in mind so the first is do, how do you determine or support any sub strategies in your deck so what i mean by this is every deck has a strategy or win con right uh, tribal decks want to use a similar tribe of creature types to gain advantage. Uh, spell slinging decks want to pay off slinging spells to win the game, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I think more often than not, every deck can support having a complementary sub strategy that could potentially win you the game if your main strategy doesn't work. What I don't mean is, oh, I have this combo in my deck if this combo doesn't work. That's that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, uh, and, I, and I think the only other really way to kind of uh, talk about this in all reality is to bring up examples, because it's kind of tough to, to, to land this plane without kind of giving you an example. So I built my Miram Sentinel Worm deck to really, in all reality, be a combo deck. The goal of the deck is to dump as many dragons as I can onto the battlefield and use effects um, that damage my opponents when things come into the battlefield to hurt the opponents that way. But the fun part about any red-green deck is the perfect sub-strategy is combat. (laughs) Combat's great, (laughs) and combat exists, and I have purposely put cards in that deck to help me in combat as well. It's not just a combo deck. It's also a, well, in the worst case where I can't get what I need to get done by comboing off, I'm just going to run through you guys with the dragons. (laughs) You know, I've built... um, um, Which is a tried-and-true strategy. I've built infinite combats into the deck. I've built sub-little things like that where it's like, okay, if my main strategy fails off the dot, I can do that. Uh, Let's go to another deck, Kess. Kess is completely built around Arcane Bombardment, 100%. The whole goal of that deck is to tutor out, play, and break Arcane Bombardment. But the one thing I found with that deck is, well... Spell slinging decks are good at one thing, right? Slinging spells. And there's so many ways you can pay off slinging spells, whether it's damaging your opponents, whether it's making tokens. So in Kess, the, like, make a ton of tokens out of the battlefield is kind of a sub-strategy in that deck, whereas what I'm trying to do is pay off slinging all of the spells. Do you guys find yourself, like, 
actively making these kind of sub strategy choices in your deck or do you find yourself kind of finding them like you said where you kind of found these weird odd sub strategies do you do you find yourself finding them more often or do you kind of think about them actively when you're putting your lists together I think uh, the Micaeus one that I had was kind of an accident. I didn't mean to build in the ability to make tons and massive tokens. Um, it just kind of happened. Um, but there were a couple decks that I can I can reference specifically um, where I found uh, um, a sub a, a secondary strategy afterwards. Right. So um, I knew I wanted everything to be indestructible with Avacyn. I knew that that was like my big thing because I playing in like some of the earlier games that I did within the pod that you had, Milzy, um, there was good interaction from both yourself and Mikey. And I did not want the interaction removing my creatures. I was very adamant that I keep my angels on the board, um, especially because most of the angels that you find are going to be like three to five power or something like that. And they fly for a lot of them. So um, I wanted to have flying creatures that I could kill you with during combat. Um, secondary strategy that I didn't, like, I, I kind of had there, but I didn't think was going to work as well as it was, was life gain. And basically just an outlast mindset. Um, I may only be hitting you every combat for, like, eight or but so you're gaining that damage, eight back. but I'm gaining that eight back. And so while I'm ticking away slowly at your health, I'm sustaining mine much better than most of the other people there. Uh, and then the other one that I had was uh, when I built out, oh, who was it? Um, uh, Azusa. Um, I built out my Azusa deck um, specifically for these uh, um, landfall triggers uh, so that I could try to get as many tokens on the board as I can, which you've seen work out. Um, but there Very were Very effectively. Oh, yeah, yeah 100%. Um, but in creating or in having a, a boatload of mana on the field at any time because that's what azusa does really well is get lots of lands out um i also have access to those massive green creatures um i'm trying to create as many three three badgers as i can or three three beasts or something uh based off of these landfall triggers but also um i can turn i can use all of these to cast uh you know hard cast like, nulamog hard oh cast yeah a lot something of things, like that yeah, yeah. Bunch, bunch of different things within that that big deck so that was my secondary was um, I may be able to make a lot of tokens off of these landfall triggers, uh, but I can also afford um, these bi because, you know, the tokens I'm trying to create are essentially free with a landfall trigger. I might as well use the mana that I have out to cast massive creatures. Yeah, so I've I've kind of got a mixture. Uh, I certainly uh, there are certainly some decks I make where a sub strategy just is not present in any way uh, and there are some where uh you know there's actually maybe not a strategy uh present really at all unless you really look hard uh, <laughs> unless you but squint really you hard. gotta squint really <laughs> yeah. hard at and, and put it under the microscope to find it um and then there are some that i think are a nice middle ground of you know having some backup uh ideas and strategies uh for you know something that relies pretty much exclusively on one thing and one thing only i will reference my uh ishin two heavens is one uh where if you can, <laughs> if you can uh shut down attacking i i found that like spore frog is my nemesis uh so many times i've played against people and then they they find a way to bring spore frog back again and again and again and just keep combat keep combat damage from happening um, so if, the, if there's a way to shut that down, then I, there's nothing I can do. My, my deck is done. Um, and then kind of on the opposite end of that, you have, uh, I have a deck for Vega the Watcher, which I think just has a really cool draw ability of whenever you cast or play a card outside of your hand, besides from your hand, you get to draw a card. I think that's a really cool thing. There's Foretell, there's Exile, there's uh, there's Disturb, there's Flashback. You know, there's all kinds of cool ways to, to draw cards. And apart from maybe a mild flying tribal theme, there isn't really a strategy there. So I, I like the deck, but there's not really a strategy to win. And I've always found myself kind of like, well, I don't know what to do now. Um, but then I think one of mine that really kind of has a myriad of ways to approach, you know, pulling out the W is uh, I have a... a 
I took one of the Strixhaven precons that was uh, Willow Dusk, but I changed it to Guillaume Master Chef. It's predominantly an arch- uh, artifact manipulation deck with the food tokens that get created, um, but I also it can also easily turn into a life gain deck, so I can just try and outvalue everyone else at the table. Uh, it also has some big dumb green creatures, so that's always a viable option as well. Um, so that it's a very versatile deck that you know, can survive a lot. And I usually find myself uh, staying and playing at the table with that uh, longer than I guess I think I normally would. Uh, so yeah, I, I have a myriad of approaches. Like, I guess that's one of the downsides of, you know, approaching something thematically as opposed to with a specific strategic sound idea in mind. I don't think sub are, uh, are required. It's not something where I'm saying that every deck should have a sub strategy. I just found the decks that have one or that can at least have some sort of secondary plan in case the front plan fails tend to perform better because you're not completely noped out of your entire strategy. (laughs) There's been plenty of games with some of these decks I've been able to just survive by kind of shifting gears just that little bit and focusing on something else. Yeah, and I mean, it's the same idea for, you know, do you have like a backup secondary commander of sorts in in the deck you know just in case yours gets completely locked out like it gets targeted for removal four times and now costs 10 mana to cast you know do you have a, a backup and this is something i've been trying to do in a lot of my decks and this is something i do i think more often than i see other people do is because i am aware that the more expensive your commander is the harder it's going to get it to be back out when it gets removed yep. once or twice um having played avison josh knows nothing about this <laughs> I think the most that she's ever cost me was 14. But I think the other thing... Um, that about, you actually paid? Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. I think the other thing about secondary and alternate commanders that people don't really also... I think it's easy to say, oh, well, it's alternate, meaning that, oh, if my commander gets removed, I use X. But I think the other thing that we forget is secondary and alternate commanders can help your primary commander as well. Thousand percent. Not yeah. only just that, but it may be able to keep your deck going if you're never able to... Okay, let's let's consider a card like Dranith Magistrate or cards like that that shut you down from playing your commander. Well, if you had any sort of alternate commander in your deck or or some kind of sub strategies in your deck, you may still be able to get your wheels turning and win a game underneath something like that. If you don't, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. So one of my favorite examples of an alternate commander in a deck, and I, the funny part is I've yet to play it once in the deck, but I know it's there. <laughs> is Muldrotha. I have Muldrotha in Yurok, uh, the yes. Desecrated. Okay. And it's because Yurok, right, cares about things coming into the battlefield. Well, what's the one thing that Yurok tends to eat more than anything? <laughs> Removal. <laughs> so yep. many times, single creatures are getting removed and things like that. Well, the great part about Muldrotha is it comes in and allows you to replay those from your graveyard, get those ETB triggers again, get those landfall triggers again, and kind of keep yourself going. With Jetmir, for example, there's plenty of legendary creatures in the deck that make extra tokens that buff the tokens you have that uh, g- may just give you like, like I, I look at something like Nayali from uh, the most recent commander decks that's yeah. kind of a perfect card for Jetmir because even if Jetmir is not down I can still give those tokens yep. double strike give I can still some, give them some, some sort of benefit even if Jetmir isn't out now if Jetmir and Nayali are both out it's kind of a waste because I'm getting double strike twice but yeah. but it but it's that that thought process of building your deck to have some other ways to punch rather than just the one. Do you guys find yourself doing this in your deck lists? Or not if it's all the time, but can you think of any examples in your guys' decks that you find yourself doing this kind of concept? Uh, I'll let you go first, Andrew, because I went first last time. <laughs> um, I think the, yeah, the thing that I run into more often is um, I, I find myself usually exclusively relying on just the like the, the actual commander itself. Um, there, there's other cards that I, you know, that keep me afloat and can still, you know, help me win the game. Like, I guess I can think of something like, um, like, you know, I have a couple of politics decks that, you know, the commanders help facilitate um, some good conversation that goes around the table um, and have some powerful effects besides, um, like uh, Brina the Demagogue and the aforementioned Queen Marchesa. Um, so, you know, the, there's cards and creatures that help facilitate a political victory. Um, but in something like that, it's more so about, I think, the 99 and how you play the 99 more so than the actual commander. Uh, but 
I'd say the vast majority of my decks, you pretty heavily rely on the actual commander itself being on the field, staying on the field, um, and and being effective in that way. I don't think that's a wrong thing. Like, I, I, I think, you know, I look at decks... Um, but it does it does make things difficult when you do bring out someone like Ishin, who doubles all attack triggers, or if I bring out um, uh, Dehada, then, you know, those are ones that are, it's like, all right, reprioritize, focus all fire, and it, it becomes a big target for removal, targeted removal or board wipes, you know, whatever people can get their hands on. So it, it can potentially make the game a lot harder for myself by not having that kind of strategy. And I'm not saying if your deck doesn't have an alternate commander, then you brew it wrong. Like, yeah. like the deck I uh, exampled earlier, Miram does not have a secondary commander in the deck um, because it's really not built to have one. It's a it's a, a core vault or something like that where the whole deck's built around your commander, getting your commander down and using your commander for value, and that's perfectly okay. I just find it can be interesting and helpful sometimes to kind of build that in as a secondary yeah. line of defense, you know, for your strategy. I've, uh, in my, my Naya Cats deck... Um, my commander there is uh, Maurice Breaker of the Coil. Um, I think he's a super cool card, very interesting, especially with the whole goad feature that he's got there, right? Um, uh, but if, uh, which, I mean, from my experience, Maurice is not a kill on site commander, right? Um, but if in certain pods he gets uh, known as like the deck that I built, right? If, if he were to become like, oh man, that's, that's the... the deck we gotta watch out for kill Maurice as soon as he comes out still got my uh my companion there um kahira the orphan guard um vigilance and plus one plus one for, for all, your cats, for all yeah. of my cats right and, and the whole deck is cats i don't think i have a single creature in here that isn't some form of a cat or something uh and then i've got uh, obviously um who i think is the best celestia planeswalker uh, of all time um a johnny um, which a johnny um, I, I've got three <laughs> there are in more there. than one Celestia yeah, Johnny. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I, I so, would see a Johnny the Greathearted. I think that thing is a beast. Oh yes, all I've your got creatures vigilance, putting a flat counter all of them. Oh yeah, I mean that's. Oh, that's I've got a. I've got Greathearted, Collar of the Pride, and Strength of the Pride. Uh, the other two are not Celestia, but um, Ripto Johnny though. Well, well, yeah, what? No, no, no sleeper agent just um, thrown in he, there. He is in there as well. For giggles. <laughs> um, he's thrown in there as kind of an idea right now. So I. I, I in the list, I technically have 103 cards. Uh, Sleeper Agent is one that I'm kind of like, eh, maybe, uh, maybe Cyborg. not. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, yeah, that's definitely one where I hard built in a uh, an extra commander, and that one's super easy because it sits outside of the game uh, up until the point that you need it, and you can pay that three to get it into your hand. Um, so, but uh, other other decks where um, I have a commander just thrown into the deck somewhere. I don't really uh, don't really have many where I have like a primary strategy that's supported by a secondary commander. I, I find sometimes just really quickly that secondary commanders tend to either a support your primary strategy or kind of be the linchpin for the secondary strategy sometimes as well. Like uh, maybe your secondary commander helps your secondary strategy. And if you see it, then, you know, you're kind of good down that path. Whereas if not, you just use your normal, you know, your your your, your head commander as well. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I really appreciate and probably why I buy so many pre-cons is because uh, that secondary legendary creature that they give you um, is, you know, usually, you know, uh, a different way to play the the same deck um, and give you some some different versatility and options on how to build it and and you upgrade it how you want. Um, But also, you know, regardless, uh, I, I... I can't think of an example where the non-face commander did not help the face commander in some way. Um, so having that built in as a uh, sub-strategy, as, as a way to support um, the deck and playing the deck itself, I, I love that that's something that Wizards includes in there because I think it would be really easy for them to just be like, here's your commander, here's your deck, it's pre-constructed, go play. Um so having that that option and that backup in those products is, I think, is really great. I think I think I agree. That's the thing I love the most about precons is that you know it, it's a detriment sometimes. Like uh, like for a new player who picks up their first precon, may not understand that oh I could make the deck better by taking out some of the 
secondary strategy cards that don't necessarily affect the face commander and adding in more cards that affect the face commander like in that sense it can be kind of detrimental but for a, a more seasoned player who's wanting to build a deck around that precon they're gonna go oh i can marry these two together in a in a different way and kind of build one that works together yeah. or, or you run into the situation that like the wither bloom strixhaven precon had where the face commander is probably the least used out of all the legendary creatures in that deck uh, I know a lot of people go with uh, Dina Soul Steeper over Willow Dust. And the funny part about Dina is it like it's in the deck because it's an uncommon in the set, but it, yeah. it really was in the set, right? It wasn't mm-hmm. even in the commander stuff. It was just it, it's simply just one of the most popular commanders from that actual yeah. set because oh, yeah. it's that good. But the good part about that is it was that uncommon, so that Wizards chose to include it in the deck. Whereas Wizards doesn't always do a very good job at including maybe some of the bulk rares or things like that. They probably could include in those yeah. precons. I think. Uh, um, one good precon example of a secondary commander that I can think of is um, one that I built a primary deck and probably my favorite deck, uh, my Grixis Demons deck around. Um, they had uh, their Grixis precon. Um, remind me the name of the, the 40K. commander for it. Yes. Abaddon the spoiler. Yes, yeah. Abaddon, right? Um, built around Cascade. You're trying to Cascade as much as you can. Um, and then um, Bellacor. Bellacor's whole idea is um cast demons so that you can deal basically shock damage ba- uh equal to their power to anything that you want to and in, in um, that abaddon deck and that would then allow you to cascade right yeah those and those would make sense together right because then um you're casting these big creatures you get cascade um and then you get the shock value from that cascade because it's casting that's an example of two very strong powerful cards that combo off of each other essentially um, and very different strategies, but that work together really well. But so an Abaddon like that list, super right? Cool. Very different from a Bellacor list. Oh, one hundred percent. Because very different. Different. yeah, I, I, uh, I have not tried to build a Cascade deck. I have some card, some decks that actually, I guess that's not true. I built that Maelstrom Wanderer deck where I was trying to Cascade, but that, that was, was more of a meme. That it that wasn't was oh yeah, the, what was it? Ninety seven lands, I think. Um, Cultivator but, Colossus in something else. And yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> who's the other one that's like Cultivator? I can't remember, but um, uh, yeah. So it. I think decks like that are super cool, and I would like to build one with two themes that marry together very well, um, very similar to that. So, Well, guys, I think this is a pretty solid place to wrap up the part one of our discussion of brewing. I hope that you guys get to get a good cross-section of where we're at as far as brewing goes. Next time, uh, we're going to keep talking through a little bit more of the practical ways that we brew decks, getting into more of the nitty-gritty of specific pet cards or things like that, and then we're going to finish up with how we test our deck, how we test our decks, how do we... Um, create expectations for them and how do we judge them based upon how we broom them yeah you get to see how big of a degenerates we are with our favorite color combos <laughs> oh absolutely <laughs> well that is that is all we have for you this time and we will catch you next time thank you so much for listening peace